My name is uh, Dr. Aaron E. Glatt, and I'm uh, the chairman of the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai South Nassau. I'm also the chief of infectious diseases and the hospital's epidemiologist. I'm also proud to be a professor of medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Great, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna uh, discuss a little bit about the basics of COVID-19 testing. So the first question is, what types of tests are available and what are the difference between them? Sure. So it's important for people to realize that there are a number of different ways that we can diagnose COVID-19 infection. None of them are perfect, and each of them has their uh, benefits and sometimes their disadvantages in using such testing. So we'll break it up for the lay audience into two groups of testing. Those are what we call antigen tests, and those are what we'll loosely call PCR tests. Now, each of them has a role, and each of them has a slightly different a situation where they may be better or worse than the other one. So we'll start off with the antigen test. This is what most people get when they have these home tests or they go to the store, their local pharmacy and purchase a test. These are often referred to as rapid antigen tests. And what they do is they tell you if they're positive, that that's probably highly likely that you in fact have COVID-19 infection. This likelihood of being real and correct, what we call a true positive, goes up a lot if you have symptoms and you're getting tested. When you use these tests for screening tests, I'm gonna have a, a party and I want everybody to go and take one of these tests before they come to the party. And those people are healthy and they don't have any other uh, medical issues. They don't have known exposures. So then these tests sometimes can have what we call a false positive, and they may not in fact go and um, be accurate because they tell you that your test is positive, but it really is not true. But in general, when people are taking these tests because they've been exposed to somebody or because they actually have symptoms, these tests are very reliable if they're positive. And they tell you, yes, you do have COVID, and yes, you should isolate yourself and make sure that you don't go and transmit this illness to other people. On the other hand, when these tests are negative, they're just not good enough to necessarily rule out that a person doesn't indeed have COVID. And that's the major problem with all of the COVID tests is that they're not perfect. The other type of test that people are very familiar with, and that is the PCR test, and there are many different types of PCR tests, there are actually some that are rapid not the ones that you'll buy in a pharmacy, not the ones that you'll uh, get in, in most places, but in certain physician offices, as well as in certain hospitals, they do have the capability of doing a rapid PCR. But most of the PCR tests that are done will take some period of time within 24 hours, sometimes within 48 hours or even longer if it's sent to a laboratory, a central laboratory elsewhere. And these tests are a little bit more sensitive than the rapid antigen tests. And as a result, these tests, if they're positive, almost always represent a true positive. The problem with these tests are is that they're so sensitive that they can remain positive even when somebody is no longer contagious and even if they don't actually have illness right now. So for argument's sake, two months ago, somebody had COVID. They thank God got better and they're recovered. And now for whatever the reason, they go and take a PCR test that test may still be positive because it is so sensitive, it can pick up even small amounts of genetic material, and therefore they can be positive but not represent acute active illness right now. In those situations, we recommend actually not getting a PCR test within 90 days of being told that you're positive for COVID because in that period of time, it's still possible that those tests will remain positive, not because of new infection, but because of the old residual genetic material. In those cases, if somebody has new symptoms, we actually would recommend getting an antigen test that may be more reliable in that setting. But in general, the PCR tests are very good. They can tell you uh, with a little bit more certainty that you did have an exposure to COVID, but at the same time, they can't always tell you when that exposure was. If you have acute symptoms and you haven't had a positive test in the past, and the PCR test is positive, that's your definitive diagnosis. You have COVID. And how do I know which tests I should take? So we usually recommend people to consult with a physician. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of medicine nowadays is being practiced in the absence of a physician. Everybody's an expert because they read something in the newspaper. 
However, there is a role for people to go and get a home test or to get a rapid test. And that is if they have symptoms or they have a definitive exposure to COVID. And certainly if they have an exposure and they have symptoms, that's a reasonable thing for a person to do is to go get themselves a rapid test. If that's positive, they should seek out a physician to evaluate them, decide what, if any, additional tests need to be done, for example, to monitor their oxygen saturation, to possibly monitor their clinical status on a, a daily basis with a phone call or on, on uh, some other regular basis. And certainly if they have significant symptoms, they must be evaluated by a physician to see what, if anything else, should be done for them at that point in time. And when should I get tested? So if somebody has symptoms, they should get tested then. If you have symptoms, that means you are being considered for active illness. If you're being tested because of an exposure, we usually recommend waiting at least 48 hours. And in that situation, the likelihood of being contagious at that point, even if you're not symptomatic, at 48 hours is a possibility. Before 48 hours, you're probably not yet going to have a contagious infection. It probably won't be recognized using a rapid antigen test at that point in time. And therefore, we usually recommend waiting 48 hours. Again, there are always exceptions to the rule, but that's the general recommendation. How reliable are at-home tests? So every at-home test is different. They're not all one and the same. Some of them are more reliable than others. But again, in the setting of symptoms and in the setting where you think that there's a clinical likelihood that you do in fact have COVID based upon your personal history, exposures, and the symptoms that you have and not having had recent COVID. So then these tests can be very useful if they're positive. And now we're gonna discuss a little bit about COVID-19 test results. So if my test result is positive, what should I do? So again, the first thing always to do is not to practice being a doctor unless you have a medical license and seek out medical care. That can be a telephone call, that can be a telehealth visit, that can be uh, reaching out to your provider and asking them what you should do, because that's the best thing to do. Get expert medical advice from the person that knows you. Not everybody is the same. A uh, uh, one 20 year old may be at essentially zero risk. Uh, another 20 year old may be a very high risk depending upon their underlying medical conditions. And you shouldn't be the one to usually make that decision. It's best to have an expert physician make that decision and decide what evaluation needs to be done, what potential treatments need to be done, what additional testing and uh, uh, ongoing monitoring needs to be done. And that really should be done by a knowledgeable physician. And if my test result is positive, when should I retest? So there isn't necessarily ever a reason to retest. If you're positive and your clinical care is, is being handled and you're, thank God, doing better, so then there isn't necessarily a reason to retest. And most of the time, we follow a certain length of time to decide that the person is no longer contagious and that the person then can leave their isolation status. That may be a five-day period of time, assuming that you have either no symptoms or your symptoms are resolving and you have no longer fevers. And then we recommend that you be extremely cautious and careful in terms of distancing and wearing a mask whenever you're going indoors amongst other people other than your immediate family, who these new people have not been exposed to you. So we recommend for at least an additional five days that you be extra cautious. And that's in general for healthy people. For somebody that's having a, a little bit more of a complicated clinical course, they're having symptoms that aren't so quickly resolving, they're having uh, persistent fevers. So then you can't assume that at five days, you're no longer contagious. And again, when you no longer are say contagious, that should be something that should be a decision that your physician helps you make and decide for you what's best based upon your particular symptoms and medical history as to when you can no longer be considered contagious. If my test result is negative, does that mean I'm good to go? So it depends. If uh, the testing was done because you have symptoms, it's not perfect. And I would still recommend that anybody who has symptoms certainly should not be going indoors to uh, public gatherings with other people. And if they do have to go indoors, they should be wearing a mask and distancing as much as possible. Again, a negative test doesn't mean you don't have COVID, doesn't mean you can't be contagious. 
And even if it's not COVID, it might be the flu. It may be some other virus that could be potentially contagious to other people. And as a result, you really don't want to, if you're sick, be around other people. And you should really try and protect everybody from whatever illness you may have. Nobody wants to get your cold, even if it's not COVID, even if it's not the flu. I have symptoms, but my test was negative. What should I do? So in that situation, depending on there are tests that you can do in addition to COVID testing to test for flu. Again, vaccination is critically important for both COVID and flu. These are diseases that we can certainly prevent to a certain extent and, and certainly mitigate the severity of these illnesses by vaccination. And therefore, you should be discussing with your physician if you have persistent symptoms and you have a negative COVID test, what other therapies may be appropriate for you. The viral Illness usually is not treated, but flu can be treated with appropriate antivirals. Most other viruses are not treated, but you need to make sure that you don't have a bacterial infection, a pneumonia that might benefit from therapy as well. And that's why, again, discussion with a physician, I think, is extremely important. It can be a telehealth discussion. It can be just a conversation with your physician who knows you, knows your background knows your risk factors for serious illness and can make a decision on the phone to say, no, I think you're okay. Just try not to be among other people. Try to uh, isolate yourself from other people and let's reevaluate in a day or two and see how you're doing. Um, is there anything um, else patients should know about this topic? So I think it's very important that patients should realize that while the Lay press reports that Omicron is a mild illness. You just get a little bit of uh, flu-like symptoms and you're gonna be fine. That's not really true for everybody. Thank God Omicron does seem to be less likely to cause severe illness. However, if you're not vaccinated, that statement is not true. Omicron can cause severe illness in unvaccinated people. And even vaccinated people, if they're not boosted, are still more likely to get into trouble than if you've gotten the booster dose. So the best recommendation at this point that I can tell people to not get sick from Omicron, and when I say sick to mean get severely ill from Omicron, is to get a booster dose of the vaccine if you've gotten vaccinated. And certainly, if you haven't been vaccinated, this is still a great time for a person to get vaccinated. A misconception or misunderstanding is that the vaccines don't work because there are breakthrough infections. Nothing could be further from the truth. These vaccines are phenomenally successful in preventing death, in preventing serious illness, in preventing ICU admissions, in preventing intubation, all horrible consequences of COVID-19 infection. And Omicron, while it's, quote, milder than Delta and some of the other variants, can still do all of these things to some people. And it's critically important for everybody to protect themselves protect their loved ones, protect their community by getting vaccinated.